Okay, we've reached the final section test, uh, section test three. It's due April 8th by 5 p.m. Um, it's most of the boilerplate here. It hasn't changed. Uh, the description of the section tests from the syllabus is there. The missed assignment policy is there. Make sure you submit it properly. Assignment submission, uh, it's your responsibility. And don't plagiarize, finger wave, finger wave. Um, this test relates to all of the uh, Nietzsche and SART readings and all of the video material for Nietzsche and SART that I've posted to Moodle as well. You're expected to engage with all of this content in addition to the readings. Right? Um, two parts. Part one, shorter answer. Um, between three and five sentences, minimally for each of these responses. Um, part two, longer answer between um, three and five paragraphs in response, minimally, right, um, for uh, those questions as well. Um, so, five questions, two points each. Um, what, three on Nietzsche, two on Sartre? Two on Sartre, yeah. Um, and uh, then, of course, your uh, comparative question, right, which isolates two passages from these theorists, right? Um, part one, question one. Nietzsche at several points throughout the, uh, the sections of Beyond Good and Evil um, to, to states uh, that we've looked at um, refers to perspectivity, calling it the fundamental condition of all life. That's from page four. Roderick, in the video provided on Moodle, defends this position, claiming that it's not a form of relativism. If, then, it's not a form of relativism, what is perspectivity? Right. So, um, I refer to Roderick there, and um, to uh, several passages um, from Beyond Good and Evil. Well, here it is, found it, boing. Um, uh, so, it's, you've got all of that here to engage with this argument. Roderick actually spends quite a bit of time talking about perspectivity um, as a position, right? Um, that is not a relativist position. Okay, question two. Uh, Nietzsche claims, we do not object to a judgment just because it's false. That's probably what's strange, strangest about our new language. That's Beyond Good and Evil, page seven. What basis for judgment does Nietzsche suggest in the place of a true and false analysis? The answer to that question will help you out in the longer answer question, I would like to point out. Okay, um, yeah, and that that is basically all right in that one passage that I quote from there. Right? So um, basically, I'm looking for you to explore this notion in Nietzsche. Um, I treat it in the video as well. I think it's one of the interesting things about Nietzsche. Um, then question three, um, Beyond Good and Evil, section 19, uh, Nietzsche claims that the act of willing, as discussed in terms of supposedly simple concept of the free will, is, quote, something complicated, something that has unity only as a word. That's from page 18. Nietzsche then lays out a four-part treatment of the will. Discuss this tre uh, treatment, examining all four parts in terms of Nietzsche's criticism of the free will. Right? This is again a very interesting passage from Nietzsche where he really complicates the act of willing. Right? Um, I've read some really fascinating analyses of these over the years so um, and written some myself so I'm interested to see what you'll take uh, from that passage. I think it's one of the most interesting passages at least in the early sections of Beyond Good and Evil. Question four, we're on to start. On page 18 of Existentialism and Human Emotions, he makes the following claim. In choosing myself, I choose man. And you'll excuse the misogynistic language there. Mankind, humankind is what he means and he should know better, in fact. Why does Sartre make this claim? What does this claim have to do with anguish or anxiety discussed from page 18 to 21, right? Remember, it's existentialism in human emotions, and he lays out the three emotional states that we should bloody well 
have. Um, it, it, and anytime we face a dilemma and have to make a choice, anxiety is the first of them, right? And this this statement in choosing myself, I choose man, right? or mankind, right? Um, is uh, I think the fundamental and more important of the three of the emotional states that um, we experience, right? that where the, the book gets its title, Existentialism and Human Emotions. So um, it, that's your job. Uh, what, what does he mean by it, and what does this have to do with anguish or anxiety? So that's question four. On page 41 for question five of Existentialism and Human Emotions, and one of the most beautiful passages in the book, I find, you know, Sartre's poetic sort of ability to explain sort of admirable, um, Sartre addresses the objection, you're able to do anything no matter what, which amounts to a criticism that his of his position that there are no a priori values or that judgment is arbitrary right in 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 his existentialism right um, how does Sartre in responding to this criticism compare ethics to art right oh look at that I neglected to give you a page reference I will edit that and aha my copy of existentialism and human emotions Page 41 is the um, quotation. You're at and, yep, top of the page. You're able to do anything, no matter what. Do, 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 do. And um, page 42. Having said that, may I ask whether anyone has ever accused an artist who has painted a picture of not having drawn his inspiration from rules set, set up a priori? Has anyone ever asked, what painting ought he to make, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so it's an interpretation of that value. So what does choice making, ethical choice making, judgment making have to do with art, right? In what sense are they alike according to Sartre, right? So um, that's question number five. Now, I have to warn you, I was a bit of a bugger um, in your longer answer question here. This is probably one of the more difficult questions I'm going to ask. I have asked you in this course. Um, so we'll read it through and see um, what we can make of this. All right. Both Nietzsche and Sartre question uh, the truth value contained within moral philosophy, like moral judgments. Can they be true or false? Right. Uh, they both hold the position that, morally speaking, judgments are not true or false. Both offer criticisms of the Kantian moral system uh, for making moral judgment, uh, the Kantian system for making moral judgments. Right. So, moral judgments are not true or false. I mean, Kant was claiming your duty, it's a clear cut kind of thing. It's true that you've got this perfect or imperfect duty to X. Right. And here is how you use reason a priori prior to all experience in order to lay out what it is true that you must do. That's Kant's position. Right? Both Nietzsche and Sartre, for different reasons, dispute this. Right? I give you a lengthy passage from uh, Beyond Good and Evil, page 13, uh, where Nietzsche is critiquing Kant. Right? But answers like the, these belong in comedy, and for uh, the, the Kantian question, how are synthetic a priori judgments possible, it's high time to substitute another question. Why is the belief in such judgments necessary? Right. Remember for Kant, and Roderick did a good job of explaining this, Kant never asked, well, are there such things as moral judgments? He said, how are moral judgments possible? Right? This you saw at the beginning of the grounding to the metaphysic of morals, right? So what Nietzsche is doing here is why is the belief in such judgments necessary? It's time to understand that for the purpose of preserving creatures of our kind, we must believe that such judgments are true, which means, of course, that they could still be false judgments. Or, to put it more clearly and crudely and completely, synthetic a priori judgments should not be possible at all. We have no right to them. 
in our mouths they are only false judgments, yet belief in their truth happens to be necessary as one of the foreground beliefs and appearances that constitute the perspective optics of life. That's interesting because perspectivity makes an appearance there. And I said um, boop, 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 that there was um, in question to some sort of helpful sort of analysis that you can do in preparation for the longer answer question. So questions one and two relate directly to um, the longer answer question here. You see we're sort of building. So same goes for question four and five and um, the Sartre part here, and you'll see. Sartre argues, while discussing the moral dilemma faced by a student, a moral dilemma faced by a student, who can decide a priori? Nobody. No book of ethics can tell him. Kantian ethics says, never treat any person as a means, but as an end. Very well, if I stay with my mother, I'll treat her as an end and not as a means. But by virtue of this very fact, I'm running the risk of treating the people around me who are fighting as a means. And conversely, if I go join those who are fighting, I'll be treating them as an end. And uh, by doing that, I run the risk of treating my mother as a means. If values are vague, and if they are always too broad for the concrete and specific case that we are considering, the only thing left for us is to trust our instincts. So that's an interesting argument against Kant that we get from Sartre. And now remember, this is essentially the position that um, your, your last longer answer question asked you to engage right, with that moral dilemma. Right? Uh, can Kant and Mill handle this? Right? And most of you, I noticed, said no, no, the specifics are too, for these general, too, 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 too gritty for these general moral theories to engage with. Uh, this is why enter both Nietzsche and Sartre, right? Nietzsche wants to claim that the kind of judgments that we make from these moral systems, the truth value of them is problematic, right? And Sartre wants to claim that the concrete and specific case is too refined for a generalized moral theory, right? So, the question part of the question down towards the bottom. Both Nietzsche and Sartre, however, maintain standards on the basis of which we can make judgments. Briefly outline each of these criticisms of Kant, right? So, outline Nietzsche's criticism of Kant and Sartre's criticism of Kant, and give a brief account of how, for Nietzsche and Sartre, we can make a judgment. So, on what basis do we make a moral judgment for Nietzsche? On what basis do we make a moral judgment for Sartre? Now, the interesting thing to note with this question is that I haven't asked you to take a position. I've asked you to interpret two criticisms of Kant, one offered by Nietzsche and one offered by Sartre, and then I've asked you to outline uh, the basis for making a judgment presented by Nietzsche and presented by Sartre. Right? So um, these are more straightforward than the argumentative questions that I've been asking you to engage with. I say I'm a bugger here because this is probably one of the more difficult questions I'm asking you to engage with, and I'm sneaking in Kant to a Nietzsche and Sartre test, right? So, um, but it's the nature of this material. It builds on it. Um, my 101 uh, class actually it had a reappearance of Socrates uh, right in the Nietzsche section for the same test, right? So this is, things come uh, maybe not full circle, but in a circle, right, towards the end here. Um, so uh, please send me an email if you have any sorts of questions about this test. Um, I look forward to reading your responses. Uh, this is difficult material, but this class builds on itself. We started off with sort of the training wheels of moral philosophy, went through the more systematic theorists, right? And now we are to the critics, the ones that want to dispute that a system can be used to make a moral judgment, right? They want to put the human 
judger back into the equation. Right? So um, I look forward to seeing what you are going to do with these questions. And um, good luck.